Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. In January 2014, an epic cold wave swept across the southeast, a snowpocalypse so severe that thousands of drivers in Atlanta abandoned their cars on icy highways and interstates. And I'm from the south. I was raised in South Carolina, and I can tell you that in the south, we do not do cold at all. Shane Campbell Staten was watching it all unfold from Harvard, where he was getting his Ph.D. He'd just wrapped up his last field season in Texas, studying the green anole lizard. And as he was scanning through photos of the storm, he came across something unexpected, a photo that included his research subject. There was this one picture of a green anole that was upside down, dead in the snow, and it was sort of a eureka moment. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I should go back out and see if these populations that I'd just been studying, if they had showed um, any sort of response to, to this pretty extreme weather event in the South. And so that's what he did, because here's the bit of serendipity. He'd actually been studying the cold tolerance of different populations of these lizards. And now the cold snap had just delivered the perfect experiment, a chance to see natural selection in action. So I went back in April right after these winter storms had subsided. And I noticed that in the south, like the southernmost population, the survivors of the storm were able to maintain function at significantly colder temperatures um, than the population before the storm. And this ability to maintain function at colder temperatures is something that we typically see much farther north. He did genetic analyses, too, and he found that the genes switched on in the surviving southern lizards overlapped with genes more typically turned on in their cold-hardy northern cousins. And the survivors also carried variations in their DNA that more closely matched northern lizards. So three things, cold tolerance, gene expression, even the gene variants the southerners carried suggested that this winter storm had indeed caused selection on the southern lizards. The analysis is in the journal Science. Campbell Staten, who's now at the University of Illinois and the University of Montana, is quick to point out that this isn't quite evolution yet. It's just one generation. He hasn't yet seen these traits passed down to another set of lizards. That's his next investigation. As for whether this is a good thing, the fact that some lizards are able to summon the ability to survive cold? So the answer is both yes and no, potentially. Yes, because if another cold wave rolls through, the surviving southern population will be better prepared, more cold tolerant. But we know that selection comes at a cost, which is death. So the individuals that died during this particular winter event, they may have had you know, genetic variants that would have allowed them to survive a heat wave or a drought or some other extreme event. And now those lineages are essentially gone. The long-term forecast for the 21st century includes more of these extreme events and more severe ones at that. So species that lose their genetic Swiss army knife of adaptive tools may again be left out in the cold. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. The Mediterranean diet is well known for its heart-healthy effects. It even sounds healthful. Lots of fruits and veggies, whole grains and legumes, plus olive oil, a bit of red wine, and fish and poultry instead of red meat. Now a study from Italy confirms that if you follow the diet, you really can cut your risk of cardiovascular disease. But here's the catch. The benefits seem to only occur if you're financially comfortable or well-educated. The findings in the International Journal of Epidemiology. Researchers tracked 19,000 men and women living in southern Italy during a four-year interval. After controlling for habits like smoking and exercise, the team found that volunteers who stuck more closely to the diet enjoyed greater protection against heart problems, but only if they were college-educated or earned more than 40,000 euros a year, or about $47,000. The scientists think that higher-income, educated individuals tend to prepare veggies in healthier ways, perhaps preserving more vitamins and antioxidants. They also favored fish and whole-grain bread, and ate more organic vegetables. And perhaps they're simply able to afford higher-quality foods, better olive oil, for example. So you can buy the 2-3 euro bottle, or you can have a 10 euro bottle. Study author Maria Laura Bonaccio, an epidemiologist. Probably these two products uh, are different in the nutritional contents, uh, in the context, for example, of polyphenol and other uh, nutritional compounds. Seems that the Mediterranean diet includes few foods that we consider rich. 
But to get the full benefits, it sure helps if you are. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Twitter has more than 300 million monthly active users, but researchers have estimated that between about 30 million and 50 million of those are Twitter bots, automated accounts that do the bidding of their code writing creators. There could be news bots and there could be spam bots. Zafar Gilani, a PhD student at the University of Cambridge in the UK. Or there could be bots which are doing political infiltration, which is obviously bad, or social infiltration, which, which could be bad. Not all bots are bad, though. Some are just geeky, like a bot that describes imaginary exoplanets, or another that tweets only prime numbers. It really depends on who the bot master is and what are the intentions, what are the motivations. Galani and his colleagues built an algorithm to single out bots from human accounts using factors like tweet frequency or content and how much users interacted with other users. And the system was able to tell bot from human 86% of the time. But in the case of celebrity accounts, people with more than 10 million followers, the bots and humans were harder to tell apart. Because both tend to tweet with more scheduled regularity than the average human, both follow relatively few people, and both upload a lot of content. They differ in the details. Celebrities don't post as many URLs luring people off Twitter, and they don't retweet as often as bots do either. The researchers presented the findings at the International Conference on Advances in Social Networks Analysis and Mining in Sydney, Australia. As bots get smarter and more pervasive online, we humans can still console ourselves with a different discovery by Gilani, that tweets penned by humans get 19 times more likes than tweets by bots, and 10 times more retweets. So, at least in Twitter popularity, humans still beat the bots. For now. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. (laughs) 